Here we shall see the first meeting of the CFR was held during the negotiations on the Treaty of Versailles. Quote, the earliest origin of the Council stemmed from a working fellowship of about 150 scholars called the Inquiry, tasked to brief President Woodrow Wilson about options for the post-war world when Germany was defeated. Through 1917 to 1918, this academic band, including Wilson's closest advisor and longtime friend, Colonel Edward M. House, as well as Walter Lippmann, gathered at 155th Street and Broadway at the Harold Pratt House in New York City to assemble the strategy for the post-war world. The team produced more than 2,000 documents detailing and analyzing the political, economic, and social facts globally that would be helpful for Wilson in the peace talks. Their reports formed the basis for the 14 points, which outlined Wilson's strategy for peace after war's end. These scholars then traveled to the Paris Peace Conference, 1919, that would end the war. It was at one of the meetings of a small group of British and American diplomats and scholars on May 30, 1919, at the Hotel Majestique, that both the Council and its British counterpart, the Chatham House in London, were born. Some of the participants at that meeting, apart from Edward House, were Paul Warburg, Herbert Hoover, Harold Temperley, Lionel Curtis, Lord Eustace Percy, Christian Herter, and American academic historians James Thompson Shotwell, of Columbia University, Archibald Carey Coolidge of Harvard, and Charles Seymour of Yale. End quote. All of the original members of this group were wealthy banking magnates and industrial sector monopolists. They may have seen their aims as humanitarian at the time, but their goal was no less than to reshape all existing society as they, themselves, saw fit. By the end of the Second World War, it was already considered no longer feasible to apply a diplomatic approach toward global government. The military doomsday backup plan was put into effect. This was when Dwight D. Ike Eisenhower warned of the threat of the growing military-industrial complex. This is when black ops and black budget spending on them became vogue. Naturally, we do not have these shadow agencies under cover of umbrella corporations protected from the all-seeing eye under the wings of the eagle, so to speak, anymore. Now we have the DHS fiasco attempting to fix an intelligence community that was already functional, only being paid to look the other way on 9-11. This has effectively allowed many of the black ops to become rainbow ops, or those performed in or on the public. So what, then, was and is this military-industrial complex Ike warned us of? What is the interim like between the implementation of the military-industrial complex and the DHS shakedown of all good cops following 9-11-2001? During the last century, from 1910 until 2010, the Federal Reserve Central Bank of the USA has held complete economic authority over the military-industrial complex's black budgets for their black op wars and black bag torture at black sites. The Federal Reserve Bank is the front business covering the money held by the CFR, Public Relations, portion of the Trilateral Commission, the military-industrial complex itself, the Bilderberg Group under the Federal Reserve, the Fed under the CFR, the CFR under the Trilateral Commission, and the Trilateral Commission under the Royal Institute of International Affairs, RIIA, and so on and so forth.